G'day everyone, welcome back to True Footy. Today we are doing underrated, overrated once again. Uh, so you submit ideas for you know topics that are, you think are either underrated or overrated and I will respond to them. So I did this video in its entirety yesterday and the audio file corrupted. So this is actually a second attempt at the same video. The first video was also 35 minutes long. So I think I'm gonna rattle through these a little quicker than I had originally intended. So let's get straight into it. Thank you once again for your submissions. The first one is from Shadowlight who says, underrated, North and West Coast body of work in development of the 2024 season, and overrated, Gold Coast and Hawthorne's body of work across the 2024 season. The Hawks do deserve their accolades, though. Will we see the same in 2025? Gold Coast are just the same. Uh, so we'll park the Hawthorne thing for one moment because we have a couple more comments on Hawthorne, so I'll include those. As for North and West Coast body of work, honestly, I think North have probably made more strides in development than West Coast this year because a lot of their improved form in the second half of the year or whenever it was probably was more born off the back of their youngsters. Uh, West Coast development will probably prove to be, you know, a silver lining down the track. There's a lot of guys that are, we think are good talents like Marek and Jinby and Hoff. Like these guys are getting to 30, 50 games. Um, so that will generally probably pay off in the future. I don't know if it's been an outstanding body of work, so I don't know if it's underrated, but when you consider how much criticism West Coast cops, maybe perhaps. As for Gold Coast, are they, are they getting their accolades? I feel like there's probably more negativity than positivity on Gold Coast. So I'm not too sure if I see them as overrated. I actually think perhaps underrated, personally, because I think they have taken strides. In my opinion, it was never really gonna click or unlikely to click in Hardwick's first year. I think they're coming. I think they're coming in a big way, and I think that, that was positive. Coupled with the fact that I don't, I haven't really noticed people rating them that highly. They've been more critical. Look, as for Hawthorne, so we got Pickle Green guy saying Hawthorne's current team. It's actually kind of hard when you think about what some people have been saying, and Tiger Walker also saying Hawthorne in 2024. I don't think they're underrated anymore. Certainly, I think um, they've been one of the buzz teams this year, so I think the recognition is there. So then the question is, are they overrated? Um... I don't think they're overrated either. They're getting a lot of attention at the moment. And I think it will remain to be seen what happens in the finals as to how good they actually are, more so than 2025. So, you know, whether or not they're overrated in 2024, I think 2025 becomes irrelevant. So if we're just looking at this year, um, you know, if they get to finals and shit the bed, then we've overrated them because some people are talking about them as a chance for the premiership at this point. And I'm, I'm a little bit agnostic on that. I don't really know where that sits because this is such an outlier for a team to come from where they have to be one of the best teams in the comp on current form. We'll see what happens, but I think they deserve their chocolates. Real Swift, he's got two. Jack Darling is super underrated. I'm sure he's had bad games this season and his slow has actually not been that bad, an important part of the forward line. And number two, the Derby has been the most, uh, the best interstate rivalry this year, despite where both teams have been at. This is an underrated opinion. On Jack Darling, overly maligned, probably don't think he's fallen off as hard as some other examples at West Coast, like a Gaff or a Sheed, in my opinion. Um, I think there is a strong argument as to why we would need to keep a fourth key forward in the team. Uh, when you're considering the depth of talent behind Jack Darling, that is really starting to emerge at West Coast. So agree that he's probably been underrated, but overall, I think we're at the point where, you know, we need to start planning for a future without him. As for the Derby, probably we, I am recording this on Friday at the start of the round of 23. So this is actually before showdown. You, you, you're probably going to see this after the showdown. So it remains to be seen exactly, but... I think both derbies lived up this year. I think we had two pretty good derbies. Um, Fremantle fans might disagree about the first one, but I think in terms of like for the neutral, shocking result, the first one, and the second one lived up. So I think I probably agree. It's probably been underrated. And we'll see about the showdown as to whether that's better. Sydney could also play GWS in the finals. So a bit to play out there. But I agree probably it's it's been better than I expected. Brooklyn says... Marvel Stadium is underrated due to its unmatched accessibility by all modes of transport and, of course, the roof. Overrated, the SCG. Most of the grandstands and the camera angles look horrible on TV and can't stand the clappers the Sydney fans use. So I have not attended a game at either of these grounds. I have a bit of an unpopular opinion that I actually kind of miss the open roof Marvel games. I know the shadows cast on it is weird and I know it doesn't make sense to open it when it rains, but, you know, if it's good weather, I reckon open it up. It looks better. Um, but yeah, having not attended either of these game, uh, grounds, I couldn't say for sure. I will agree that the SCG is horrible on TV. It, like the, the angle at which you watch play unfold is Scheiss House, as they say in Germany. Samantha Jane says Schultz is overrated. 
just, uh, just hasn't had the same impact and benefit to the team at Collingwood as he had at Fremantle. I think he's getting criticism at the moment. So at the moment, is the opinion overrating him right now? Uh, no, but I think broadly you mean we've overrated him as a player. I don't know if I'm there yet. I don't know if I'm there yet. I think the body of work at Fremantle was very good. Sometimes you just move to a system that isn't as good or as conducive to your style, and it might expose you a little bit. He's still kicked 22 goals this year. I don't think he's had the same impact, but more than a goal a game and four tackles. Definitely Collingwood has overpaid when you consider it was essentially a top 10 draft pick they gave up for him. But, um, you know, I'm probably not there on a green that he is overrated as a player. He probably just needs time to gel. I mean, West Coast had a lot of players that came over and took a long time to gel. In particular, Jack Redden, Lewis Jetta. They were rubbish at first. Spin Doctor says, Michael Voss as a coach. I loved him as a player, but the question has to be asked if he can coach. He failed at Brisbane. Now, the team on paper that screams top four, if not premiership, he's failing there too. So he inherited a list when he took over that was, you know, a fair bit more along development-wise than his predecessors. He's inherited them at a time where expectation is now finals. He got them to ninth, and um, I suppose they, I don't know if you'd say they bottled that, but they obviously lost at last gasp to Collingwood that year. Midway through the season, I think the way he galvanized that team and was able to perform well in finals bodes well for him, and it's a really good sign. And the fact that they were 11-4 and four this year before the wheels came off made me think, you know, he's not necessarily the root of the problem or anything like that. I think time will tell. I do agree that their premiership chances are strong, consider, well, not this year, but in general. It's a premiership quality list when you consider, like, a lot of the key components. I'm not saying it's, like, a perfectly well-rounded list, but... I know what you're saying. The core of that team could and potentially will win a premiership someday. Is he failing because of the last few weeks? He's probably, oh, I don't know. It seems harsh. I think I still need to see a bit more at the risk of fence sitting. I think up to this point, he's been good. This has been a seriously challenging period for that club. And I'm really intrigued to see how he gets them out of it, to be honest. So I'm a little bit early on that. Yes, he did feel fail at Brisbane, but I do kind of think he was rushed into that role, to be honest. User says Geelong's midfield. So Geelong's midfield, is it underrated or overrated? I, I don't think anyone's saying that it's a great midfield, simply because on paper it's quite thin. I think that's the broad understanding this year. It's probably performed better than I expected. When you, They are still bottom six for clearances, below average in scores from stoppage. And I did highlight at the start of the year that um, you know, maybe they need some more ball winners through the midfield. If you look at all the top possession getters, none of them are midfielders, and that's kind of true this year as well. The top four ball winners are Holmes, Stewart, Duncan, and Myers. Stewart plays a bit in the midfield now, I know, but he also still plays a lot of his behind the football sort of role. Uh, and Holmes has only attended 29% of center bounces, and this is also evidenced by the fact that they have the most makeshift midfield out of any other team that I can see in terms of who spends time in there. Dangerfield is the most regular midfielder this year and still only attended about 65% of center bounces. On the whole, though, it has probably performed a little bit better than I expected. So I will say they are closer to be underrated, certainly not overrated. It hasn't proven to be the Achilles heel, and I think Dangerfield has still had a really good year at 34, which is probably something I didn't quite expect. So I'd agree probably underrated. Not that you actually had an opinion offered there, but I will say underrated. Tog of Slism says Zach Guthrie is one of Geelong's most underrated players. When you ask someone to name a Geelong player, they normally say Stuart or Henry. I agree. I have noticed Zach Guthrie be an absolute jet this year. I don't think I knew he was that good prior to this year. So certainly a player that has shifted my perspective. George Hustler says Geelong being in the top four is overrated. I feel like they've uh, had a good run at playing opponents at the right times when they're out of form or coming off a short interstate break. Yeah, it's hard to hard to really know. I haven't been paying attention closely enough to notice that. But I think the body of work has been solid. You know, they certainly started the year well, form slump, and they're doing things that other teams are not doing, and that's winning fairly consistently right now. They also butchered Hawthorne, um, although they did lose to the Bulldogs heavily as well. And I think their win in Perth against Fremantle was the most legitimizing win of their season so far. I think that's not to be underrated. So Geelong being in the top four, I don't feel like they scream flag contender to me personally from when I watch them. I think there's too many holes, but they do have the firepower and the scoring capacity to win games purely through efficiency, like considering how dangerous their forward line is. And a dangerous forward line goes a long way in football. So... I think they could get deep this year by virtue of the fact that they're going to finish probably in the top four. 
Uh, I'll be surprised if they, they're they there on grand final day, but we'll see. So maybe that means I agree with you, but they are doing things other teams are not, and they've earned the position they're in. Leon Mead, D'Ambrosio and Lloyd Meek. I agree. I do think we are getting at this point where reputation has lagged behind performance. Performance has been good. I think that is starting to, they're starting to close that gap. I think people are starting to realize how good those players are. Coaching from the sideline, is it underrated or overrated? I think it is something that can be used as a tool at certain times. And I've heard um, you know, Adam Simpson talk about this. He sort of goes down there when he feels like he wants to get a vibe of the group and be more in touch with the players. But what you sacrifice is you know, a full ground view, for instance, and access to tactics and potentially numbers that they might be getting up in the box. So I don't think it's something you can do all the time. Um, I think it's just something you can use, a little tool to potentially, you know, perk players up. We see coaches do it quite a lot, to be honest. So hard for me to assess that one. It's hard to offer an opinion on whether I think it's underrated or overrated. Probably underrated, but I certainly wouldn't be, you know, coaching the whole game like that. Flag Mantle says, Josh Tracy, all Australian, underrated. Um, yes, another player whose reputation is lagged behind performance. Um, 45 goals in 20 games this year, seventh in the Coleman, even at the start, well, not start of the year, but like a couple months in. I remember saying on the football come down, I was like, nah, he won't, he won't make top five, um, but he's bloody close. So he's had an outstanding year, and I think, I think that recognition will start to come now. Max Hansen, Ruben Jinby in the back line. Yep, he hasn't been there long enough for him to be considered underrated yet. But I think he's so much better a footballer in the back line, and I think he's found his calling. So he might be a defender midfielder somewhere down the track, but at the moment he, he looks like a real strong, resolute defender, and I think that's where we play him going forward. User says, Kai Lohman still underrated. Only talked about when he kicks goals and cops criticism when he doesn't, but he's been getting into the game and getting a lot more disposals recently. Yeah, pretty young player. I picked him in my 22 under 22. Um, and that drew a bit of criticism, and to be honest, maybe they're right. Maybe they're right. But 22 goals from 21 games, 11 disposals a game is fairly modest, and three tackles, but I do think he's a good player. But I think he's played less than 30 games. So, you know, I'd probably hold fire on too much criticism for a guy like uh, Kai Lohman. He's very young. 2021 draft, I want to say, potentially 2022. Um, So very young in the scheme of things, and I think he's had a really good year and will continue to progress to being a pretty good footballer, I reckon. We got a bunch from DRDC22, so I'll rattle these off. Jinby, uh, Paul Curtis, Carlton, the drafters rebuilding mechanism, beverage, English, white shorts, grand final replays, rule changes. I'll keep it short. Jinby sort of already answered that, starting to become underrated now. Paul Curtis always tears up West Coast. I've always thought he was good. He's had a really good year. Probably, again, reputation lagging behind performance. Carlton. I feel like they cop as much criticism as they do get plaudits, so they're probably somewhere in the middle. The draft is a rebuilding mechanism. Still very important, but the nuance is that first-round draft picks are not the sole way to rebuild your list. You've got to hit those late picks, as we saw in my Hawthorne video, and that is a trend with a lot of premiership teams. Luke Beveridge. Underrated probably because of the criticism and the snap reflexive reaction we have to putting pressure on him when the Bulldogs have a form slump. I think they're a good team and I think he's a good coach without being necessarily outstanding. Tim English, tough one because I feel like he gets maligned a lot as well and possibly actually underrated because I don't think he has the reputation of any other Australian ruck, to be honest. There's a lot of doubters. And we are recording this, well, I'm recording this not long after he just got beaten by Riley O'Brien. Um, You know, he fluctuates, to be honest. But I think, generally speaking, I would take him at West Coast. Part of that is also because our ruck situation is dire. White shorts, I like him because, you know, I think it adds a little bit of contrast when we play games. I like that. Mind you, I do kind of like it when, you know, Sydney and Gold Coast play teams and both teams don't wear white shorts. I like to mix it up a little bit. Grand final replays underrated. I kind of liked it. I kind of like that. I must be the only person who thinks that. Maybe another underrated opinion. More than happy to bring that back, considering it's super rare. And rule changes. The idea that we're trying to improve our game and and fix inconsistencies, obviously it does create more inconsistencies. But I think, you know, certainly once we've started this process of trying to innovate the game, we've got to continue it. You can't just stop arbitrarily, randomly, in the middle of time somewhere. So broadly speaking, I do think that rule changes are necessary and yeah, probably a little underrated. Shadow Light says underrated and overrated Essendon's 2024 season. I'm not too sure what you mean by that. I would say that 
Assessing Essendon is interesting. I, I, I said this in a recent video, but whenever they fail, the conversation is medi immediately blown out against the backdrop of 20 years of failure, or at least in their terms, because they haven't won a final. So I do think that we do, and when I say we, I mean the football media generally, but also Essendon fans, kind of blow out of proportion when they fall short. I think whatever way you slice it, Essendon has improved on last year. Now, is that improvement sufficient? When you consider the maturity of their list, the fact that they've had an extra year under this coach, and considering the latter position earlier this year, you could say they've fallen short of expectations, but you look at it in totality, they have improved. So I think probably the negativity is overblown, is what I would say on SNN. Leo King says Thursday night football and AFL snaps says Friday night double headers. My preference is probably to spread the two games as a content creator is better for views and video performance when there's not a game on. That being said, um, having to choose between two games, I would prefer to have the two games separate. Corey Blackledge says Western Bulldogs 2016 or the Eagles in 2018, their final series specifically. Um, hard one to, to assess. I, I think if you're like a neutral and looking at how great those final series were, I think the Bulldogs is probably the best one I've ever seen. Um, you know, West Coast had two wars against Collingwood, outstanding games and a big blowout win in the prelims. So I'd say the Bulldogs final series definitely takes the cake there. Although, you know, which one would I rather see again? West Coast. Sean Christie says, underrated AFLW and West Coast backline and fixture bias. Overrated Collingwood and Melbourne. We also have AFL Snap saying AFLW. So we'll park AFLW for a minute. West Coast backline, probably underrated. I think Jeremy McGovern's season in particular has been underrated. And I think Hoff is another one of those players whose reputation is lagging behind performance. He's been outstanding. It's a pretty good backline considering the crapness of the team that probably gets overlooked. So yes, I'd say underrated. Fixture bias. I think we live in a world where our teams, well, the, the league, sorry, is you know inherently uneven and there's asymmetry and it's it's really hard to get that right. I think one way we can improve this is the travel burden. I am a West Coast fan, but I think the travel burden when you crunch the numbers is insane. And yes, we, we have a true home ground and some other teams don't. They play a lot of neutral games, but you know, West Coast and Fremantle are both going to Tassie, um, both in the same year. And we have also made a trip to the Gold Coast. Not sure about Fremantle, they might have done. Um, yeah, I, when you consider that Collingwood's never gone to Tasmania, I think that's a very fair criticism. Are Collingwood and Melbourne overrated? Um, it's hard to say that a premiership team's overrated. I think the reality is it's really hard to back up. And I think Collingwood's fallen apart a little bit this year at times, but it doesn't mean they're screwed. I do worry about their list position though. And if it wasn't Collingwood, I would be really looking at it and going, how the hell are they gonna get out of this? The reality is Collingwood have this ability to, um, you know, I think recruit well, maybe not in the first rounds of drafts, but I think they'll be able to re-image re their list through attracting players. Melbourne, um, I think they've caught their whack this year. I don't think they're, um, overrated or underrated i think they have performed quite poorly this year and again another team will be watching this off season the good thing about melbourne is they have drafted well over the last four or five years um you know rivers pickett uh, van royan um judd mcvee uh, there's more I, I think they're they've got a bit of a baseline so if they do shuffle their list a little bit they're not starting from ground zero aflw though yeah probably underrated by virtue of the fact that a lot of people will criticize it you know unfairly and i think it's still in its infancy and it's getting there and i think we should support it because it is really important uh particularly to young female athletes they're very passionate about it so i'm all for giving it a go uh, i won't deny that the skill level and you know it, we shouldn't be comparing apples with oranges um but it's still got a bit of a way to go but we should be patient with it flag mantle so sydney's forward line is overrated oh uh, yeah i wasn't aware that sydney's forward line was really given a lot of plaudits so i have looked at the stats so it's interesting so i'm recording this actually while they're playing yes and it's the last quarter right now i'm gonna have to watch that game later but the goal spread has been really interesting so amati's kick 35 haywood's kick 35 as well that's more than i realized warner's kick 31 that's outstanding for a predominant midfielder Logan McDonald, 31. Papley, 30. He's missed some games through injuries. Heaney's hit the scoreboard 25 times. When you consider as well, McDonald and Amati are both younger than 25, and McDonald is 22. I think that, uh, that diversity of goals is good. Now, a lot of those are midfielders, to be fair. Uh, well, two of them. And, and Papley's not a key. He's a medium forward. Probably would be winning their goal kicking had he played every game this year. But I, I don't mind that as a mix. 
to be honest, different ways to hurt your your team. I mean, look at North Melbourne last year. They had someone come third in the common, I think, right? Larky, 76 goals, and the next highest goal kicker was like 29 or something like that. So I think the diversity is actually good. So I don't think it's overrated. Partly that's because I don't know if Sydney's forward line gets talked about in isolation. Callum Williams is Rowan Marshall. Yes, the, he never gets talked about as an All-Australian chance, but you know, look at his numbers. 20 and a half disposals, 26 hitouts, five and a half clearances a game. And he's hit the scoreboard 13 times from 21 games. Six marks a game too. I, I think this guy's been very, very consistent. And um, I don't think he's as good as Max Gorn. But I'd say that the reputation does not match output there. Riles Macker says underrated Sam Collins. Yes, he is having an AA caliber season. I think he could go close this year. It'd be very interesting to see how that plays out. Very surprisingly handsome man too. I didn't really realize that until recently. He's adopted some strange looks, but yeah, he gets away with it. Sports Panda Boy says Connor McDonald. I have been on the Connor McDonald train since the start of the year. I made a video, underrated young guns, 10 underrated young guns. And I think Connor McDonald is that. Not a super high production, 17 disposals and a goal a game, but very good playmaker. Cool Shadir says the microwave. 16 goals from 13 games this year. And the Hawks are apparently 10 and 2 with him. Again, recording this before... Who, uh, who, who do Hawthorne play this week? I'm forgetting off the top of my head, but underrated by virtue of the fact that he was pick 56 and is playing regular footy. Um, he, he is a good young player. Leo King says that Darcy Wilmot does not get enough credit. He has not missed a game since that elimination final versus Richmond in 2022. He's been super consistent. I agree with that. I think if you look at Brisbane's probably two most improved players this year, I would have gone Logan, uh, Lohman, uh, and Logan actually, and... Um, and Darcy Wilmot too, good ball user. Gets it 20 times a game, good player. Riley Burke says, Sam Frost, uh, I agree. Underrated lockdown defender. I had serious concerns about Hawthorne's key back stocks at the start of the year. Him playing within himself and playing to a role with strict adherence to that role, I think has been a really good plus for Hawthorne. Shadow Light says, Cherry's consistency across the 2024 season as an old style big ruckman and overrated Max Gorn's 2024 season with injuries and form slumps. So we'll park that for a minute because of the next ones they're related to. Okta AFL says Justin McInerney, he really brings the Swans midfield together and again doubles down on overrated Max Gorn does not deserve an old Australian jumper this year. McInerney, yes, because I think his speed on the outside does add something that Sydney, you know, they're, they're probably a little bit, no, oh, they've got Goulden as well, but I think it's the blend of attributes there that make a really good midfield. Um, you know, without him, I think Heaney and Warner and Goulden would still be unreal, but uh, he does add an important piece. I would agree with that. Cherry also been unreal this year, be worthy of an Australian jumper, but I do think the criticism on Max Gorn is overblown. I've seen it, uh, you know, I was watching Daniel Hoynes talk about it and he's still the number one rated player or Ruckman this year, I believe. And also it's his best season in six years. I know people don't like to look at stats, but I do think there's also a recency bias against Max Gorn where he did have a form slump due to injury, but he's been very good across the year and, and was very good against Port Adelaide too. There's also this reputation bias where because Max Gorn has been so good for so long, we, we naturally get bored of his performance and we stop giving it the same credit, whereas Cherry's come out of nowhere. So I think, I, I think you could justifiably have Cherry as the second All-Australian ruck in this team and fit them both. Uh, but that's easier said than done. Layup line says Alir Alir. Um, I agree. I agree he is playing really well at the moment and probably underrated due to the fact that his form dipped after his All-Australian. So when he was uh, new to Port, I think he won All-Australian in his first year. Was that 2021, I want to say? Came out of nowhere, dipped below what we expected of him and now he's back in a big way. I don't know if he'll make All-Australian, but one of the form key backs of the competition right now. Leo King says Max Michelani, an underrated young defender in my opinion. I agree. Actually, I was funny enough, I got bored and I watched uh, my podcast that I did with Busher at the end of the 2022 draft, I think it was. And we were talking about how Adelaide were forced to overpay for Max Michelani because uh, Sydney bid on them early. And that's, that is technically true. But now I'm thinking like, what did Michelani go? Like pick 17, pick 18? You'd absolutely pay pick 18 for a player of his quality. I had him in my 22 under 22. Leo King also says, Zach Bailey, I think, is underrated. One of those players that can change a game in a few minutes, but never spoken about. Look at his first half of the granny, so electric. I love Zach Bailey. I do agree with this game winner. Um, we literally did it against Collingwood up at Siren, but I think a player who can change a game with moments. When you look at the consistency of performance, okay, he's consistent, but he's not a hugely high productive production player. 
And he could become that later in his career. He could do a Toby Green. I think Toby Green continued to get better into his late 20s. Um, you know, he gets about 16 possessions and a goal a game, which doesn't jump off the page. But I agree, Zach Bailey is a very entertaining player. Jack says Harvey Thomas is an underrated young player. Yes, I had a look at the stats again. And amongst rising star eligible players, he's the number one player for tackles inside 50 and second amongst those rising stars for goal assists. And I do remember very unfondly his rising star nomination performance against West Coast in round two. 21 disposals, eight tackles and a goal. Uh, and one goal too, actually, it was. So very well-rounded performance. And the Giants do have this fleet of small forwards um, that is just growing. It's 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 unreal. And finally, Frio better says, true footy and true eagle. Uh, it is not for me to say whether I'm underrated or overrated. I'll leave that to the audience. Um, but I think... In our, all of our collective professional lives, right, we all probably fluctuate where periods where we're probably feeling a bit underrated um, and probably other times we might feel a little bit overrated. And I think for me, the natural fluctuations of when people engage in content, um, you know, will dictate this. So for instance, start of the year, end of the year, big bars, lots of views, trade period, lots of views, middle of the year is really tough. So for me, like halfway through the year, I'm probably working hard without getting much um, recognition and that's fine I completely used to that and then you know come the trade period I'm probably working the same or in fact it's probably a little bit easier with the nature of that content and you know this channel gets more popularity so it is what it is I'm full, I'm cool with it True Eagle I like to think is underrated purely because it's brand new and I like to think there's a lot of Eagles fans who probably don't know that there is now um, you know a fully fledged Eagles fan channel which I'm hoping to develop and grow so I'd like to think that's underrated, but again, not for me to say. Anyway, guys, it's been a long video. I'm gonna wrap that up. Thank you so much for your submissions, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.